What's going on, Johnny Nation? Welcome to episode 104 of the Eye of the Storm podcast. My name is David Barrow. It's the sixth installment of CoachCast with St. John's assistant coach Bob Walsh. The St. John's season has been over for about three weeks, but as we all know, there really is no off season anymore. I believe you had a few days off around Easter, Bob, but it's full steam ahead for you and the staff. Welcome back to the first one here in the off season. What's up, Dave? How you doing? Good to see you. It's good to see you, Bob, after the UConn game Friday night at the Big East tournament. Did you think St. John's did enough to have their name called on Selection Sunday? I did. I did that night. It, it was interesting. I walked uh, I walked past Matt Norlander after the press conference, and, and Coach had said to the guys, like, look, you know, be very positive when they ask you. Like, you know, we, we feel like we've done enough, and – uh, Matt Norlander grabbed me and he, and he said, he said, I think you guys are in. He said, I think he said, but there is a scenario. And I said, I said, yeah, no, I know. I said, look, you know, if things change tomorrow, um, but to be honest, yeah, I did think after we had beaten Seton Hall, uh, you know, we were in really good shape. Obviously had we beaten UConn, I would have felt like we were in great shape. You know, we lost a close game to UConn. I felt pretty good about where we stood Friday night when I was watching Marquette uh, Providence in the garden with my wife. Felt like, you know, we were going to have a day off Saturday and get back to work on Sunday. The room, obviously, as the names are being rattled off, filled with a lot of emotion, disappointment afterwards. And, you know, what... What is the feeling in that room from the coach's perspective? I mean, obviously you feel for the kids. I know the, there was this big sentiment that felt for the seniors who wanted to put a stamp on their time at St. John's, especially Joel and, you know, Danis, who was the leader on the floor. I mean, what was that room like for you guys and as coaches, uh, obviously going through that disappointment? It was interesting. It wasn't easy. It was the first time I had ever watched a selection show with a team and not gotten in. Uh, so, wow. you know, you don't really know how to prepare for it. It's funny, though. Everything changed on Saturday, right? We got up Saturday. We were still at the hotel. You know, we ate breakfast. It was going to be a day off. We were talking about plans for Sunday. And, you know, we met as a coaching staff. And it was like, okay, what well, you know, where do you think we're at? What, how are we doing it? And, and it was like, well, coach here, you know, we need Florida Atlantic to win. You know, we, we don't need Oregon to win. You know, we, you know, there were these teams where it was like, you know, three or four teams that, you know, if, if a couple of them won and went on to win their league, we would have been in very good shape. Every yep. one of those teams lost on Saturday. Yep. So going into Sunday, it, I know personally, I thought we were right on the bubble as of Sunday, Saturday couldn't have gone worse for us uh, with all the games. And I thought, okay, I think we're right on the cut line. I, I think we're either going to be last four in first four out. So we got together, we had something to eat with the team. Uh, we watched the selection show together in our film room and it was hard because you're, first of all, there's only a few slots you're going to be in, right? We knew we weren't going to be a six seed or a seven seed, right? We were, we're looking at the, you know, the 11, maybe 10, you know, and, and I think the, the playing games ended up be, being tens actually yep. not 11s because of, you know, so like you, there's only a few brackets within the brackets where you're like anxious a little bit as the names come up. Uh, and it was, it was hard. You go through the first one and it's like, okay, we didn't get in there. They go to commercial. Uh, you know, I, I know when Virginia popped up, that took a lot of air out of the room. That was one that was kind of like, okay, I didn't think they were getting in. I thought right. we would certainly get in ahead of them. When they showed up, uh, that made it hard. And, you know, it was tough. Like you said, it's the seniors you're really thinking about. You know, we had four guys of the six who had never played in the postseason before. You know, Naheem had, DJ had, uh, but... And you look at a guy like Joel watching, you know, what ends up being the end of his college career on TV uh, and his legacy changes a little bit, you know, in the minds of people where it's like you could have been the guy who led St. John's back to the NCAA tournament. So it was challenging. It was like an air out of the balloon feeling. We were expecting to be there all night. 
you know, that's one of those nights where you find out who you're playing at 615 and you start getting film. And, you know, next thing you know, it's one in the morning and, mm -hmm. you know, you're still there getting scouting ready. And we also had the option, the, the possibility of having to leave on Monday if we were going to go to Dayton. Right. So then it ends and you just sit there and go, wow, I have nothing to do. <laughs> you know, I literally don't have anything to do. I can just go look at the brackets and see who I, you know, I think might win. So it is, uh, it was a tough room, you know, coach handled it great. Obviously the guys were mature. They handled it great, but it was very disappointing. It's hard to watch guys, you know, sort of see their career end uh, watching the selection show on television. You know, it's interesting hearing some of the kids talk about, talk about it now. Simeon Wiltshire told Newsday and Roger Rubin, he's like, it's not happening again. They're using it as motivation. He's like, I'm watching these teams play. We're better than these guys. We should have been there. And if you look at a lot of the predictive metrics that St. John's had over the last six or seven games, it lined up for St. John's to be one of those teams that goes on a run. And I think a lot of people were going to have St. John's as one of those teams that could do some damage in the tournament should they get in. You handle the schedule for St. John's. Things like KPI became so much more important, it seems, than the net, than things like Ken Palm, things that we heard all year. And it now puts a wrench, in my opinion, in how you are supposed to or trying to schedule moving forward. As somebody that has to now map out and blueprint your way for next season. How do you take what the committee just did and the inconsistencies of what they said mattered for each team and try to plan ahead? It's a great question. First of all, I look at this year's schedule and if you had said, we're going to win 20 games, we're going to go 11 and nine in the league, it being the second rated league in the country. And we were going to finish with a net of 32 and a Ken Palm of 26 on Selection Sunday, I would have said we did our job, like perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our sure. strength of schedule was like top 30, top 40. Our non-conference strength of schedule was, I think, 135, something like that. So I think we did our job as far as putting the schedule together because really the one central metric that, that seems to be used that combines a lot of the other stuff is the net, right? And... There's no power six team that's ever been 32 in the net and not gotten in, you know, Indiana state who obviously has a completely different resume than us. Yep. The only team ever with a better net that didn't get in. And that was this year. So, you know, one of the challenges with the committee and the schedule and the metrics is there are enough different metrics that they can do two things. They can certainly justify you know, why every team got in, you know, if it's, if they didn't have a, enough quad win, one wins, they can say, well, they played a really tough schedule. You know, if, if their Ken Palm wasn't great, you know, maybe it was their net that was better or something, you know, there, there's so many metrics. And then the other side of that is there's enough metrics that it always keeps you guessing, right? It's always kind of like, well, which ones are going to matter the most, you know? And, I don't know that you can really get caught up in that. Like I've always looked at when I, since I've done scheduling, you know, you want a very good net, right? You want to be in the thirties, at least in the, in the low forties in the net to, to, you know, as a power six team, a big East team, you know, to have a really good chance to get in. You also want to be able to say you did what we asked you to do. Right. right. Which is something that probably disappointed me a little bit. Like, we played good teams in our non-conference schedule. Now, we didn't play a top 20 non-conference schedule, but we didn't play a 350 non-conference schedule like uh, some teams did in some other leagues that got in. And I've always looked at it like if we're close, I thought what might separate us this year before what happened Saturday was the committee would say, look, they did what we asked them to do. They went out and played some people, you know? Um, so trying to figure out which metric is going to matter more is 
a challenge. And I think it's kind of futile. I, like, I'm not sure. And I've gone through it. I went through every schedule in the Mountain West. I went through every schedule in the Big 12. Like, what did those teams do? You know, both of those leagues had some top tier teams like Kansas, San Diego State, who played great non-conference schedules. So it's not true that every team in the league just played donkeys and tried to beat them by 50 to get their metrics um, and their numbers up. But they played great non-conference schedules at the top of the league. And then the middle teams, the bottom teams in the league, the teams that weren't necessarily sure how good they were going to be, didn't play great non-conference schedules. But they all had very good non-conference seasons. I think, you know, San Diego State might have had the worst non-conference record in the Mountain West of those teams, and they were 9-4. and four. So they went out and won pretty much all of those games uh, as a league. They probably won 90% of their non-conference games. So, uh, you know, that the top six teams did. So when you look at that, I'm sorry, I was just saying, so when you look at that, there isn't one formula that says, hey, this is going to get us to this point, right? We've got to sort of do what we're capable of to prepare us to be good in the Big East, right? To prepare us to be a top five team in the Big East, which we were, and you think that's going to carry some weight as the second best league in the country, and then, you know, play a strong enough schedule where you've got some games that you win that are considered good wins, you know, and that's what we tried to do. Maybe I'm a little too close to the sun here, and perhaps this is because St. John's was right on the cusp and it's an issue, but shouldn't this year be kind of the the point where people like you who have said that this is a moving target right now that it shouldn't be that there needs to be some more transparency for teams so that they know what they're shooting at how and and val ackerman has said that there's going to be meetings there already has been meetings with the athletic directors and with the team so that they know I guess how to potentially go about scheduling but shouldn't there be a some sort of a campaign whether it's from the commissioners of the leagues whether it's from the ADs shouldn't there be transparency and a criteria I mean there can't just be a guessing game year in year out Ideally, you'd like to say that would be the case, but there's so many different teams at so many different levels and so many different leagues with with so many, you know, different priorities. Right. So you can't just say like if you were to say, well, you have to play at least, you know, 10 quad one opponents. Well, you know, the top six leagues in the country would get all the bids. Right. Because other teams don't have those opportunities. So what they what they try and do with all these different metrics to defend what they're doing, and, and I understand it, is they're trying to find a way to evaluate the teams based on all the different scenarios that you have, right? You have an Indiana State that doesn't play in a great league. They play in a good league, but metrics-wise, they're playing a lot of quad threes and quad fours, and they go, you know, 30 and four, right? You know, how do you compare that to a Seton Hall who, you know, struggled with some some losses non-conference, but went 13 and seven in one of the best leagues in the country. So it doesn't always work out, obviously. And I think they're trying to take a lot into consideration. I understand why that is. Ultimately, you know, it's not, it, it's it's a different group of people in that room every year, right? And there are certain things that are going to stand out to, to certain, you know, members of the committee and, and they're going to, come to a consensus and say, hey, this is what's really important. Look, I thought quad one opportunities were really important. I thought that would improve your net. Uh, I thought, you know, that would improve your Ken Palm. We did fine in those areas. The one thing we didn't do, and this is where we don't have a lot to complain about, is we didn't beat a lot of high level teams, right? We went two wins against the field. Right. Well, well, and I, I don't even know, right, against the field, but you know, that's a little bit, you know, subjective because it's like, well, Utah didn't make it, you know, had they won one more game and they got in, that would have given us one more win. But, you know, our quad one record, right. Our quad one record was four and 10, you know, our record against the top four teams in the big East was two and eight. Right. So it doesn't provide, it doesn't 
help us as a staff. And I understand why fans get into it. And, and trust me, we get emotional about it too. But it doesn't help us as a staff to say, well, hey, we got screwed. Like, like they, you know, what helps us is, okay, what can we do better, right? If we're going to play a neutral site game against BC, we got to win that game. You know, the Michigan yeah. loss turned out to be a really bad loss. Now they had a surprisingly bad year and they certainly didn't look like a bad team when they came to the garden. But, you know, ultimately if we had one more games, look, we were up three at Connecticut with four minutes to go. You know, we had a nine point or a 12 point lead at Marquette. You know, we had a seven point lead at Creighton, you know, with five minutes to go. Close out those games, win one or two of them. And we're not talking about it. So I, I think like what I, what you said, Simeon said, it's like, yeah, like our determination has to be, let's not put ourselves in this position. If we feel like we were one of the best teams late in the year, if we feel like we were a team that could go on a run in the NCAA tournament, well, we have to prove it all year. And ultimately we just didn't do enough against good teams on our schedule to get us over the hump. Bob, as an assistant coach, as a coach who has been in this for a long time, this was your first year in Queens with Rick Pitino as well. Looking back on the season, how do you measure how successful or unsuccessful the team was? Is it black and white to you with wins and losses? Is it postseason success? What's your philosophy behind grading yourself on the year that was? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think I look at it a little bit different. Like it's never personally for me, it's never black and white. You know, it's never just, well, if you go to the NCAA tournament, you know, you had a great year or if you didn't, it was awful. It's not that simple. Um, but, you know, I think we fell short of our goals, right? We want to, I mean, Coach Patino makes it clear and he says this to the guys a lot, like he's chasing greatness. You know, like when, when we beat Providence at home and we had a big lead in the first half and they came back and took the lead, we ended up winning by a point, you know, when we had control late, you know, he was unhappy in the locker room. Like, guys, I don't want to just, you know, be a good team in the Big East. You know, we were four and one, I think at the time, like, I'm chasing greatness. Like I want, I want us to be great at an elite level all the time. So um, there were a lot of good things this year. I think there was a lot of positive, you know, the progress we made by the end of the year. Uh, it didn't always look pretty, certainly in the middle of the year. Uh, I think players got better as we went through the season. Uh, I think as a team, it took us too long to sort of gel and figure it out. You know, you can say, well, transfer portal you had to fill the whole roster so many new guys but like that's the deal you know like it it i mean that's what that's what happens you know this year we'll have a little bit more continuity for sure so uh, i would say you know it was a good year it, you know it might have been a good first year but it wasn't what we expected was it a great year no i think i think we want to be competing you know for the big east championship you know was playing on friday night a good first step sure but we want to be playing on Saturday, you know, and, and we want to be in the NCAA tournament and we want to be, you know, playing on the second weekend, you know, and, and really, um, you know, one of the elite teams that, that you look at and say they have a chance to be great. So it is challenging to really define how this year was in one or two words, because there was a lot of positive. I think um, we did a lot of good things and we were playing very well at the end, but ultimately it wasn't enough to get into the NCAA tournament. And, you know, that's where we have to get to. I mentioned that you're in charge of the schedule. We've heard Coach Patino mention next year's schedule a handful of times throughout the year. We know St. John's will be participating in the Bahamar Hoops Classic against two opponents between Tennessee, Baylor, or Virginia. That's on November 21st and November 22nd. I'll be there. Very much looking forward to it. I know a bunch of St. John's fans are excited for that. But the rest of the schedule, for the most part, is pretty unknown. We do know there will be a Big 12 opponent. And Patino has mentioned that he wanted a game at Arthur Ashe against Duke, which I believe is not happening. He wanted big name opponents like in Alabama. I understand you're knee deep in scheduling, but you're juggling the recruiting and the portal and everything right now. What is going into your thought process right now with non-conference games? 
uh, who you're scheduling. How difficult is it right now, essentially, to only have half your roster and trying to make a schedule as well? And do you have any tidbits about the schedule that you could possibly share? We're right in the middle of it as far as the scheduling goes. And one of the reasons why not a lot is done is because, you know, we wanted to see how this year played out, right? We want more information. Like, okay, is there something we need to learn from the NCAA tournament this year from the committee that impacts our schedule for next year? So we're literally having all those discussions right now. I mean, we have a shell of what we think the schedule is going to look like, you know, with Without the the Big Ten games, you know, you have a Big 12 game, which will be a home game. You have the Bahamar, that'll be, you know, two other high major games. You know, hopefully all three of those end up being quad one games. So we've got to balance, you know, getting a couple of more, you know, good non-conference games, whether those be neutral site games or home and homes with, you know, playing some home games, uh, some guarantee games, uh, make sure we get, you know, uh, our fans at our games in Karnasek Arena in uh, Madison Square Garden. And also, look, not really knowing. I, I know one thing. Our roster will be younger next year than it was this year, right? That's when, when you have six 50-year guys and, you know, five of them played a ton of minutes for us and you know those guys are leaving, it's hard to imagine we're going to have that much experience on the roster. Now, we can certainly stay old and obviously the transfer portal has changed things. So, with the combination of, you know, what happened with the committee this year, uh, um, you know, the instability of, of rosters and, and not really knowing, you know, you're not looking at it like you used to where it's like, okay, these are the 10 guys we have coming back and we're going to, we sign this kid in the fall and we're going to add a piece or two. And we know, you know, what we're going to, what we're going to have out there. Uh, it, it takes a little longer to put it together, but I think uh, we'll have, a fun schedule and a very competitive schedule. And I think, look, coach's nature is he wants to play good teams. You know, quite honestly, sometimes I have to talk him out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're like, he's, you know, like coach, hey, we're coming back from Thanksgiving. Like maybe that's not when we want to play Duke, you know, or, or something like that, you know. Uh, but he wants to prepare us to win the Big East. And to do that, he wants to play good teams. You know, he talks about it a lot. He'll look at a team that, that you know, plays a really light non-conference schedule and then gets beat in their first two league games. And he says, well, look, you know, it doesn't make sense that you play all those lower level teams. So there's a balance in there that we have to find. Truthfully, knowing what I know about the NCAA tournament committee and what they did this year and what we did with our schedule and everything I've studied, I don't know how much I would change because you're not exactly sure what's going to be really important to the committee next year. You still have to control what you can control, which is you got to play some good teams. And, you know, we're going to have a chance to play some really good teams in, in the Baja Mar and play a really good, you know, big 12 team. So it's not like we're going to make a major change to our schedule. Coach wants to play good teams so that we prepare ourselves to win the big East. And if we do that and we handle our non-conference schedule, we should be in a good position come Selection Sunday. So there won't be nine bye games where you plan on trying to beat them by 60 every single time like people are trying to say. The truth is that philosophy has come up. There's no doubt. It's been talked about, right? I, I can't say that for sure. That's an option that's on a table. Uh, I don't think that goes against, I think, how Coach feels, and, and I agree with them, about how you prepare a team to win in the Big East, right? right. Uh, you know, now there is some merit to having good metrics. You know, there's also some talk from the NCA that maybe, you know, the, the, the efficiency standards are a little bit, you know, too impactful. Like why should the last minute and a half of the DePaul Providence game when Providence has their walk-ons on the floor and they give up 12 straight points, like why should that matter? Uh, so, you know, again, I, look, there's there might be some merit to that. I don't think if you look at the Big 12 and the Mountain West, you can say, oh, that's what they did. And that's all they did. There are probably some teams that did that. Right. So but balancing, you know, the guarantee games, the right guarantee games, the right home schedule, you know, testing yourselves against good teams, whether it's on the road or neutral before conference play, it's a challenge to put together the right schedule. 
I think we put together the right schedule this year for our team. And I think we handled it pretty well. What we didn't do was, you know, our, our, our two non-conference games, Big 10, Big 12, ended up being, you know, I think quad three games, which you hope they're higher level than that. Um, and we lost one of them, you know, and that hurt us. And then within the league, we struggled with, with the top team. So I think our philosophy is pretty sound. I don't know that it'll change a ton, but we're literally talking about that right now before we sign games and say, hey, you know, so much goes into it, right? The dates, you know, arena availability, travel, you know, metrics, all that stuff. So it's a puzzle that we're putting together as we speak. Coach Petito said after selection Sunday that St. John's would be playing in the NIT instead focusing on next season and the roster and the transfer portal. When you guys got together on how to attack this offseason and taking the lessons that you learned from year one into year two, what was kind of the plan for this summer and uh, moving ahead as we get ready for next November? Coach talks all the time about getting better fundamentally. You know, he feels like we weren't necessarily as good fundamentally this year. You know, he talked about it all year. And that's probably something we can focus more on, uh, which, you know, that's right in our wheelhouse with the amount of time we spend on the floor with individual development. Uh, I also think defensively we have to get better. You know, I think we were inconsistent defensively this year. And I think last year with so many new guys, you know, the summer was sort of an introductory period, you know, and it was it was individual workouts and basics and and the team stuff was very basic. And, you know, I think we've got to get to a better place as a team defensively this spring and summer, where when we come in in the fall, we're not, um, you know, we're not going slowly through the defensive stuff and we're not sort of finding our way. So I think that's skill level fundamentals, um, you know, the team defense on that side of the ball, I think those are going to be really important points of emphasis this off season. And ultimately guys have to make a big leap, you know, Brady Dunlap, Simeon Wilcher, those guys have to make a big leap. You know, a guy like Zuby, like he's got a chance to make a big leap for us and, and really um, be an impactful guy. And, you know, the summer is certainly going to be fo focused on development like it always is. I'll ask you about those three guys as well as RJ in a second. How does the staff devise the plan for the returning players in the off season? Were there end of season meetings with each player and goals and plans for the off season for each guy? Was it film study on areas to improve and then action plans on how to do so this summer? How do you guys individualize it for each of the kids that you know are returning? It's all of that. Yeah, it's all of that. Coach meets with all the guys uh, a lot and talks to them. You know, very, coach is very honest, very upfront. Here's what you have to get better at, you know, whether it's, you know, scoring inside with your left hand, whether it's improving your shooting range, whether it's being able to, you know, handle the ball better against pressure. So uh, he he has those meetings with the players. Each staff member you know, sort of has three or four guys in, in position groups that you meet with and you watch film throughout the year. So you're showing them fundamental stuff, stuff that we need to work on. Uh, and that will continue heading into uh, the spring and the summer where, look, a lot of coaches player development is, you know, and it's legendary, it's 40 years of it, uh, is offensive skill work, right? So it's improving your shooting, it's improving your shooting range. Uh, it's, fixing maybe there's a, a little bit of a hitch or a flaw in your jump shot. It's footwork and stuff like that. So yeah, absolutely. The meetings take place. Coach meets with the guys. Uh, we see our guys, you know, two or three times a week, talk to them about what they need to get better at. Uh, we go into the individual development sessions with a plan for those guys. And then, you know, when we get to the team sessions uh, in June, when summer school rolls around, there'll be a plan for the group as well. So it is pretty specific. The guys have input. You know, we talk to them about what they feel like they need to be, you know, to improve upon so that they can take some ownership. But there is a plan for each guy uh, and coach is pretty specific about what you need to do to get better and where you want to be come, you know, late September when we'll start team practice. 
something that you just mentioned, like uh, a specific hitch or or something in a in a shot that you guys see. Earlier this year, you mentioned to me how the staff in the summer and the off season leading up to this year, you guys worked with Glenn in regards to changing his jump shot. RJ is somebody who obviously we know got to get his health first and foremost, uh, 100%, just had uh, some surgery, but he's going to be fine for summer workouts. For RJ, in my opinion, obviously a very novice basketball mind, but RJ's jump shot seems to have a little bit of the opposite issue that Glenn had in regards to having a lot of an arc to his shot. Could that be something that you guys look at for uh, for RJ? I mean, are these the kind of things that you guys look at to make players a little bit more efficient or uh, just something that could potentially be a, a point of emphasis? That's exactly what we look at. Yeah. And every guy, you know, coach, coach loves uh, to sort of tweak and, and, and redefine shooting. You know, if somebody, you know, gets the ball a little bit, you know, off center and their elbow is out or, you know, they get it too far back and, you know, guys will spend, you know, they'll spend 30 minutes doing form shooting, you know, for part of their individual and, and RJ with his, you know, his injuries that he had this year, did a lot of that. Right. And, and, you know, when guys are resting their legs in the off season or, you know, th there'll be a lot of form shooting. So uh, absolutely. It's specific. You know, RJ's a guy who's really talented and that's one of the things, you know, he's got great talent. He's great in the open floor. He can get to the rim. RJ, if you're not a consistent shooter, you're going to be easy to guard. So what's one of the main things RJ has to work on His jump shot. And he will work on that literally from the tip of the arc in front of the basket out, um, you know, working on his form, getting comfortable. And he's been doing that all year, to be quite honest. Uh, he's, you know, he's a guy who puts in a lot of time on it. So hopefully it's an area we'll see improvement. Coach Patino mentioned towards the end of the season that his plan was to make Zuby into a power forward this upcoming season. So I'm to play. We saw him display some three-point shooting towards the end of the year. His great defense was on display throughout his first season at St. John's. What is the focus with Zuby to make that desire of turning him into a four-man a reality? Well, I don't think it's turning him into a four-man completely, right? He'll also, you know, he'll play the center spot as well, uh, I think. You know, he he's, can guard, he can rebound, he's big, but he's mobile and he's got good hands and feet. So I think as far as improving his ability to play the four, it's skill development, right? It's his ability to shoot the ball. It's his ability to handle it with a little bit of pressure, not like we're going to ask him to bring it up the floor, you know, against the press. But when he gets pressured in, in a handoff situation or some zoom action, he's got to be able to handle that uh, and improving his passing ability, you know, being able to, to, to pass it, you know, either side, um, you know, off the bounce against pressure. So it's really just improving his skill work. He's got really good feet, but his feet generally are, are when he's got his back to the basket or he turns and faces and takes one dribble. So it's, you know, improving that skill so he can be a little bit more comfortable on comfortable on the perimeter because uh, he's going to have to, you know, our foreman faces up and handles the ball a little bit out there. And we think Zuby can do it. Brady Dudlap also getting minor surgery on his left thumb. Again, expected to be fine for summer workouts. He had a few games this year where he was a real weapon with that jumper and that uh, three-point shot. It was his calling card and something he has said that he's the most confident in. What are some of the things that the staff would like to see from Brady this summer and uh, in regards to his development for next year? He needs to get stronger. You know, he needs to get physically, and, and he has. I think he's he's already put on about 10 pounds since the end of the season with, with Jeff wow. Evelard, who does a, a great job with our, our strength program. You know, Brady was a little too easy to push around, you know, and, and when you're trying to come off screens in the Big East and this and that, he's obviously got a ratchet. I mean, he can really, really shoot it, and, you know, we're going to need that from him. But he's got to be able to handle the physicality a little bit better. I think his foot quickness – you know, can improve a little bit, you know, uh, moving side to side, um, you know, using screens better. And then his ball handling ability, right? There, his The scout on him is going to be run him off the line, make him put it down. He's got to be comfortable with more than just a one dribble pull up. He's got to be comfortable putting it down, um, you know, maybe changing directions and getting to the rim to keep defenses honest. Simeon Wilcher got to learn under the wing of Danis Jenkins this past season. 
by all accounts, he will be on the ball a lot next year as one of the main guards on the roster. With the point guard as essentially the quarterback on the floor, having to know all the assignments, the plays, how big of a step up will this be for Simeon? How much of a leg up does he have because he got to watch Dana so closely, sort of like an Aaron Rodgers got to watch a Brett Favre type situation? That's a great comparison. Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre. Uh, pretty, pretty big step up because we are so comfortable uh, with DJ and what DJ brought to the table as far as his ability to run the team, keep the team together, understand where all five guys are supposed to be, timing of delivering the passes. And that's, you know, two years, just one at St. John's, but he was also the key guy for us when we were at Iona as well. So it is a big step up for Sim. Uh, Sim has a great basketball IQ and is very talented. I do think playing with and against DJ every day helped him. Uh, sometimes it frustrated him and we had to remind him like, Sim, DJ's like five years older than you. You know what I mean? Like he's been doing this in college for a long time. Uh, so, you know, you can't get frustrated, you know, you have to, you have to learn from it. And he did do that. So uh, we expect a big leap. I think with Sim, it's going to be decision-making, you know, when to make the pass, when to go, when to score. He's got a ton of natural ability. I think really it's slowing the game down in his mind a little bit, which, you know, DJ just had a natural ability to do that. Everything was, was chaotic. And DJ was a guy who had his hand up, you know, calming everybody down, going at the right pace. When Sim, you know, figures out that pace and, and that decision-making, he's got a chance to be terrific. The dead period for recruiting ends on noon on Thursday. It'll be a very busy next few weeks for St. John's as they look to add five to six players. Bob, I haven't asked you this before, but given that it is the reality of college basketball now and you coached well before it was a thing at multiple different levels of the sport, what are your feelings on the transfer portal and how it's changed the landscape of college basketball? I'm fine with it. I, I think it it's the right thing, to be honest. You know, I know it's very, very different. And I get how fans are like, you know what? We don't have guys for three or four years and nobody sticks around and that makes it harder. I, I do think it will settle down a little bit. But, you know, look, the kids should have the right to go where they want to go. Uh, I think it's on the coaches now to make sure we deliver what we are selling them in recruiting, right? And that's, you know, I think that might have gotten taken granted for granted a little bit where it was like, OK, you signed a kid as a freshman and he's not going anywhere and we'll have him here. And maybe when he's a junior, he'll be pretty good. So you've really got to pay attention to the development of each individual as a person and as a player. Um, you know, I think. In some ways, it makes it easier, right? Like instead of betting long term on some freshman kids where you're like, OK, we're going to bring in five of them and hopefully they pan out. You're actually seeing guys play in college at a high level, sometimes at your level or maybe a level below you. And you say, OK, he was capable of doing this. That will translate for us. You know, there, there's less guesswork, uh, but it is it is in a tight circle. I mean, it is it is done in a tight window, you know, where you don't have like all year watching kids and saying, hey, maybe if we sign this kid in the fall, here's what we can get in the spring. It's literally like a a six week sprint where you're trying to fill your roster. So it's a little bit different. Ultimately, I don't think it's, I, I think it's good for the game. I really do. I think it's good for the kids to be able to have the freedom to get to the level that they want to get at, um, that they want to get to. And, and, you know, the idea that like all these kids are transferring and, and, they're leaving and there's no loyalty. I don't think it's realistic. I, I think in a lot of cases, it's mutual where it's like, hey, you know, I don't know if you're going to get what you want here as far as playing time or what you're looking for, you know, and there's opportunities uh, out there for you. So it takes some getting used to, uh, but ultimately, and maybe I'm in the minority as a coach because it is a little chaotic this time of year, but I have no problem with the transfer portal. I think it's the right thing. There's about 1,500 kids in the portal as of today, April 10th. Uh, the portal 
closes on May 1st in regards to when you have to go in. You mentioned it's the six-week sprint right now. What is St. John's and the staff doing? Obviously, we're not going to name names, but there are visits, plenty of them, that are starting this weekend at St. John's as you guys look to fill those five to six roster spots that I mentioned. I think, and I've said this to a lot of people who I have spoken to, I think one of the biggest differences this year for you guys compared to last year is obviously Coach Patino and you guys got here at the end of March. So you guys had a more finite period of time to really get going and evaluating the portal. And obviously with all the departures, I think that now you have less of that. You guys could be a little bit more selective. You guys have had a lot more time to look at what's going to be in the portal, potentially what kind of needs the team will obviously need. And so I'm curious what is going on day to day with the coaching staff. Obviously you don't need to name names, but how is the staff approaching the portal? What kind of, meetings are being had what's being discussed and how are you guys using your resources in order to find those players to fit in for next year we connect on it every day and and we connect on it at night as well somebody goes you know we check the portal in the morning you know you check the portal in the afternoon you're looking you know to see who, what names are there somebody go, you know goes in and there's a text going out hey i know this kid from such and such a school you know um his aau coach reached out to me you know, let's get filmed together. So we're meeting just about every day as a staff and discussing it, you know, so it's like, okay, what kids are available? Where's the fit? Where's the need? Where do we have a connection, right? We've all, you know, we have a lot of experience. I mean, I've been doing this for, you know, 30 years and and Massiello and, and Van, Ricky, I mean, Talik. So you've got connections everywhere, people that you can talk to. Hey, what's his story? What's he looking for? Uh, and then you kind of, you know, tear them up. Like, okay, who would be our priority guys? You know, who are our, maybe our next level guys? Um, how would these guys fit together, right? Well, if we get this kid and he can play, you know, this position, do we need a more skilled guy at that position? You know, would these two fit together? Uh, and, you know, you have those conversations. Then what we like to try and do is get to a united front. Like, okay, here's our priority at this position. Here's our prior, here is our priority at that position, you know? Then you talk about your guys. Well, you know, could Brady swing? Could he play this position if we got this guy? You know, would Sim fit with this guy? If this guy, you know, needs the ball in his hands, could Sim play a little bit off the ball? So those discussions are having are, are being had every day. And then we're putting together film. You know, we have a great support staff of, of video guys and GAs where it's like, okay, hey, you know, B. Irv, Brandon Irving, our, our video guy, it's like, Hey, we need film on this kid and this kid and this kid, put it together. And he breaks up three games and chops up the film. And then we all have it and we take a look at it and we discuss what we think. So um, it's a, it's daily, it's ongoing. You know, it goes into the evening where it's like, Hey, you get a text like, Oh, wow, that kid went in the portal. Yeah. He's really good. You know, maybe he would, you know, I had a connection to him from, you know, when he was in high school or I know his prep school coach and those conversations take place. We formulate it. We, we kind of attack a game plan. We do have visits set up with guys that we want to get on campus that we feel, you know, can help us, but it's fluid. It's changing every day. You're trying to, you know, find this guy and, you know, okay, that guy's in there. Well, that guy could really help us. I think we have a chance and that may alter what you think about some of the other guys. And, you know, ultimately uh, the talent is there, right? The talent just has a little bit more freedom to move. There's still the same number of slots. There's the same number of kids, if not more, looking for those slots. It's right. just a matter of, of finding the right pieces and then selling them on what we're all about at St. John's. Everybody listening to this, you heard how Bob just outlined it. So everybody who keeps asking me, who's coming to St. John's? Who's getting on the visit? Who's this and that? I told all you guys that it keeps changing every hour. You hear, you heard it from him. It, it is, you, you see how hard this is to keep track of. So all in due time, uh, have faith in this staff. Bob, we'll end it here. Your book, Entitled to Nothing, teaches the lessons of how to build a sustained championship culture, along with stories and, you know, lessons about leadership. You discuss how in order to establish a culture year after year that players have to take ownership 
of that culture. And it's not just coaches telling the players what to do and they have to follow it. Tying it all together with the transfer portal, has that become harder to do? And how much of that culture that you discuss in your book gets accomplished over the next few months in the summer as you guys start putting a team together? Wow, you've read the book. I mean, you got right right into the meat and bones of it. I'm, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm excited about that. That was that is that that's the core approach. You guys, to the book. you guys can pick up Bob's book. I'll put a link in the description. He didn't even pay me for that plug. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I, I think. Do I think it's harder because of the portal to do that? I wouldn't say that. I think it's more important. You know, like I was when I was coaching that team at Rhode Island College that I wrote about in the book, that's when I realized it's a different team every year. Now, even if you have 10 guys returning, right, say you lost two seniors who started, but you had a freshman who was really good who came off the bench. Well, now that freshman expects to start as a sophomore, right? That sophomore wants to be all league as a junior, right? The junior who was the backup big who came off the bench, you know, thinks now I'm going to start. It's my time as a senior. So even though the personnel may be somewhat the same, the team is totally different, right? Like what Brady and, and Sim and Zuby expect out of themselves and are looking for next year is going to be different. So I think getting the guys to sort of take ownership of the culture and getting the guys um, to understand what it takes is even more important. And it took us a while this year. I think what you saw this year was a group that, really finally started to take ownership of it late in the year, you know, and, and they came together kind of rallying around each other doing that. So um, does it happen? It happens immediately, right? Like it happens as soon as we get our guys on campus. So the thing with the portal is we won't have this team together until if we're lucky, probably mid June and hopefully we'll have everybody here but that's not necessarily the case. We do get eight weeks during the summer. So I'd say that's really when it starts, but it starts now with Zuby and Sim and Brady. And, and you know, cause I've always said this, like your culture, if you want to know what a, what a team's culture is all about, don't ask their seniors, watch their freshmen, right? So watch their newcomers. They won't all be freshmen, but you know, your seniors can sit there and say, hey, we're about this, 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 and this. Watch the new guys when they show up on campus and they've been there for a couple of weeks. See what they're doing, right? That's really what your culture is, right? Because they're looking around going, okay, you know, wow, look at the way Simeon Wilcher is working in individuals. Look at how hard Brady Dunlap is running. Look at the way Zuby runs the floor every possession in practice. Like, that's what we do here. So it's, I don't know that it's necessarily harder, maybe a little bit harder because you don't have as many guys to rely on. I'd say it's probably more important. It has to happen quicker. And it happens, it starts happening now with only a few guys here because you're trying to establish them as guys who are going to set the tone. Right. But once it gets to mid-June, it's full speed ahead. You're starting to build your team. Assistant Coach Bob Walsh, thank you for joining us all season. The first here of the offseason. Best of luck building that schedule, the roster, everything in between. Look forward to chatting again soon and again next season. Dave, I appreciate it. It was a great pleasure. Thanks for everything you do for us. Johnny Nation, the portal, everything in between. <laughs> Back open at noon on Thursday as recruits start putting on that red and white jersey. We'll be back on the mic to discuss it all. Johnny Nation, thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time.